Okay, guys, uh, thanks for coming for the last day of the conference. Um, let's get started. Okay, cool. Hi. I don't have my name up there, but I'm, I'm John. Uh, I'm going to talk about Tetragon. I've got 30 minutes, right? Let's talk about Tetragon. Cool. Um, so if you don't know, Tetragon is a... Oh, there we go. Tetragon, that's a, a cool picture. Um, Tetragon is a runtime observability and, and uh, kind of security tool that we wrote. Um, we developed this about three years ago, uh, I believe, at this point. Maybe even a little bit longer, I'm not sure. Um, and then we open sourced it last year. Um, the basic premise is that um, if you think about the Cilium project, we have the CNI, which does all the networking and the routing, load balancing, all of these functions. And what people were also asking for is like an observability platform that pulled in all the Kubernetes, all the cloud native information, and then um, using BPF, so they want low latency, um, low overhead, um, and then the ability to sort of aggregate and collect all these statistics from the system. So you can think there's a lot of processes being executed and exited, and they want some way to pull all that data out of the system and then put it in some database or in some SIM or some Splunk. I'll show a couple of examples of things that we can build on top of this. Um, I've got a couple of Splunk dashboards I can show um, that are actually, um, we're actually running on our clusters, but they're kind of mimicking what our customers are using. Um, so I can share a couple of those. Um, they basically use the output. And um, this is just kind of a fun graphic that we share sometimes, usually for higher level talks. But um, you can see there, there's an agent and a BPF piece, which we would kind of expect that then hooks all the, the different parts of the stack. Um, this is just quick agenda. I'll do some demos, like I said. And then at the end, we can, I have uh, kind of things that we're working on. All right. So, if the first question is uh, maybe is is why do people care? Like, what do you want to do with Tetragon? And we talked, I talked briefly about that, but one of the pieces you can think of is is I want to know everything that's ever executed in my cluster, right? So you see every process in the system, um, and over time, which is quite useful if you then put that in the database, like we were saying. You might want to know all the versions of libraries. So this is a use case some people say is like I have a cluster, it's got a few thousand nodes or something in it, and then the question is. How do I know if um, all these images I'm running around, what library versions they're running? So like OpenSSL, you have a patch for OpenSSL, and you want to say, how can I find anything that's running the old version? Right? That's a common, common use case. Um, I have some other things over here. There's a lot of networking stuff people like to do. They want to collect all the networking statistics, latency, bytes, packets, histograms of all these things, because those are useful, P99 latencies, all this kind of good stuff. File access, and so you can go through the list. There's a, there's a handful of things. Um, usually, though, when people talk to us about this, they also want it to be, um, I put real time, but near real time. Um, so we have folks with like SLAs of um, four milliseconds on the network, for example, so from end to end, so not including um, from application to application. Um, so you, know, you can't stick a middle box in something like that, um, like a, a proxy or something. Um, and then they want, you know, almost no CPU usage, and they typically will say things like, I want to have less than 500 megabytes in my pod, so something small. Um, this is just to cut down on the cost, right, because it's going to be running on every node. You don't want to be too bulky. Um, minimal application impacts. So there's usually this, uh, um, you know, benchmark people will run. They don't want to turn on Tetragon and then be all of a sudden be like, okay, now all my applications are 20% slower. You want to keep things moving along. Of course, there's some impact people are okay with, um, but you know we keep it try to keep it as small as possible depending on what we're doing. Um, and there's also offline and online models. So we, we have some folks that are, for example, um, air gapped. You don't have an access to the internet or the network. Sorry, just a quick question. Yeah, so sure. if if you have such low uh, CPU usage um, and memory usage, like why would the application be impacted? Is it because like low latency means that other low latency applications suffer or? So there, uh, I mean, this is just kind of a high-level slide, but there's, there's really two pieces, right? So the one piece is how much CPU your agent is using, so like collecting data out of BPF, aggregating statistics, and presumably pushing them somewhere, mm -hmm. right? So like, there's the cost of that, and you want that to be low, um, because that's, you know, if you're on, um, in a big data center, you're, you're taking cycles away from something that's, that's probably paying money to be on the system. Um, uh, and, you know, we're not generating revenue. Um, and then the... 
the other flip side of that is you don't want to insert yourself into an application with a BPF program and then create latency on the application itself. So think like um, like a web server, Apache web server, or a, like a MySQL stuff, right? If you stick a BPF program in there, you can you can re bring down the latency of like request response on that. Okay. On the application. So yeah, don't don't attach like probes or something that would slow down. The yeah, yeah. You imagine there. putting a K probe in the hot path on DevQ XMIT, for example, right? Okay. Like okay. maybe you, maybe you hook every function that has a SKB in it, right? <laughs> With yeah, a K probe, oops. right? Like it's going to okay. be noticeable. So, yeah. John, another question. So, is sure. your agent running the guest, right? The the agent is running on the host. The the guest of, in the VM, I mean. Y yeah. So it, um, it, I mean, it depends on the environment. So we can run. Uh, we have bare metal environments. We have Kubernetes environments, and then we have virtual machine environments. So um, in the bare metal, we'll just be on the bare metal system on yeah, the, that host. Is the host. In the, um, in like a cloud environment, yeah. we'll be up eight, uh, what daemon set basically. So you'll be an agent running in a pod. Which will also be on the host typically. Okay. Um, in the virtual machine case, they'll run it in the VM. Okay. Right. So the ma the metrics that you collected are specific just to the metrics observed in the, for example, in the VM or in the pod, right? So you can't get the so metric on the host. In the pod, we, because it's BPF, we can run on the host. Okay. We we have enough. We get enough privileges from the kind of pod yeah, deployment system that we can, even though we are a, a pod, we still are are sort of yeah. have access to the host. As a container. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so this is just some things that we do. Um, the basic idea here, when we think about this, is we want to, and we talked about this earlier, right? It, it, Tetragon is is mostly like a platform, is, is how we've been thinking about it recently. Um, it gives you a mechanism to deploy BPF hooks, uh, a way to aggregate statistics, and, and then push those into a sim or a security pipeline or Grafana. So we have a, like a protobuf backends and, and gRPC and JSON logs. And usually people will collect those and then feed them into their security pipeline um, or their um, alerting systems as well. Um, just a little bit about the model. Um, so if you think about the threat model, um, we don't trust the users. Um, being a security tool, which is slightly different than perhaps a debugging tool where you might be fine with U probes, for example. So in general, although we can do U probes and we will do the U probes in some models, um, we're very clear to distinguish between um, like security observing and um, profiling and, and sort of debugging. Um, the reason is because you know you can't trust user memory. Um, if you're trying to try to make security decisions based on user memory, um, this is going to open you up to any sort of security vulnerabilities. Um, this mostly comes to play if you think about syscalls, right? So if you have a syscall, it has a pointer to user memory. We won't, we, we can read that, but in a general, like in a deployment model, we wouldn't do that. We try to hook something lower in the stack. And even if you're lower in the stack, you need to make sure that you're not looking at user memory, right? Um, if, if you're in the security mindset, which is, which is right now kind of the main thrust of some of the work we do. Um, U probes are also there. They're interesting because we've had a few customers say, I want to know um, if this function in my application is ever run. Um, because I know it probably shouldn't, or I know like I know something about the control flow. Um, stack traces will be interesting there, but we haven't quite got there yet. Um, then the other thing from a design side, like we're really interested in running on larger systems. Um, so we'll try not to do things that won't scale um, to thousands of nodes. Usually this comes into play when you're in, in sort of a Kubernetes environment. There's a QP, Kube API server in Kubelet, and you can put watchers on that, right? Um, you can watch for other pods and things like that. Um, but you can imagine if you were to say, like, tell me every pod in a, in a cluster, for example, with 1,000 nodes, you might get the server to tell you, you know, 10,000 things. Um, so those, those types of things come into play. Um, we always try to fail closed, um, meaning if you're going to... If you're going to have a gap for some reason, then let's just fail. Um, this could come into play, for example, if you overrun a map. Um, so we very rarely use LRU maps for this reason. Um, we do for some cases, but you can imagine if there's like a socket statistic, you're going to either allow or deny the socket. Um, if you can't make the, connect, like the correlation from that socket to the process to the policy, 
um, rather than just say, okay, like a, like a routing system might say, okay, I'll drive my best, um, we generally try to just stop that from happening if, if we can't make that connection. Um, and the last one is be kind to the security stack. This is a big one. Um, you find this pretty quickly once you try to deploy this. The security team doesn't like it if you blast them with, you know, 100,000 events a second or something, right? Like their whole security stack will fall over. Um, and so to fix that, um, and the other one is if you send out like a, a tons and tons of events to Splunk where they're paying a per message cost, um, you also very quickly get people upset with you. Um, so we do a lot of things to filter and aggregate the events, um, put some rate limits on them, compress the, um, the cardinality of the events so that instead of saying, I want to have an event for every connection, just tell me all the endpoints in my node or something. This is all about cost and uh, making the data usable. Um, okay, cool. So those are the, the kind of high level things. And then at the, at the sort of core, the very first like, kind of core functionality is exec tracing. Um, and you can see there's a JSON output on the left. So basically, we hook the, the exec events and the exit events. And what you get then is a, a sort of JSON here that describes the process. And some, some interesting things are an exec ID, which is a unique ID for, the, for that execution. Um, we have some work, in, some stuff in the works to do the SHA-256. Um, there's a couple PRs out in branches with this. Basically, we're taking the, um, the digest of the file if you're running something like FS Verity underneath. Um, this gives you a strong identity versus just a binary name. And then you can see we have a whole bunch of other stuff there. I, I even cut a bunch of stuff out because you know, I needed to fit on the slide. But we have all of the pod metadata, which would be the Kubernetes context, the binary name, working directory, arguments. There's the namespaces and capabilities and C groups and all that kind of stuff. So you get a good, a good view of where everything's running. And this is important. Um, out of that information, we can build two things. The identity, um, which gives us a uni unique uh, kind of a compressed version of what that thing was, and then a location. So you want to know what cluster, node, namespace, pod, container, time. And once you put these two together, uh, you get a globally unique ID um, that's going to be unique in your database for that thing that ran at that place it ran at. And what this lets you do then is you can say, a month from now, somebody tells you there was an incident, you can go back into your database, you can find this thing, and then you can, because all the few next events that we'll show next have this information, you can say, I want to know everything that that, that object did. Um, and if you, this is, I, I did this for fun. I pulled out like five minutes of exec data out of our, our cluster, our little test cluster, and graphed it. And you can see that um, basically what that is is all of the nodes are the executables in the, and the links between them are the, um, the parent-child relationship. Right? And so you, you graph it, and you can see there's like you know, thousands and thousands of things, and that's, that's a pretty small cluster. So. Quick, quick question? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah, when you, when you were first describing it, it seemed like a way to basically like, document everything that's happening, which is obviously incredibly useful. Yeah. But then also in the last slide, you said that you rate limit like, the events that you send to security teams. So mm -hmm. is it both sort of like... It's both sort of like a way to kind of document everything for investigations later, or is it also a real-time observability tool that like notifies if there's an ongoing incident? Yeah, so we, we actually have folks using it in both cases. So there, there's really users on both sides of that, and, and users that go both ways, actually. So one, one use case is the like, kind of post-analysis. Like you have a security team, they get an incident report, they need to go back and dig through the logs and figure out what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. And so then they can say, okay, what executed during this time window? What was it talking to? Um, oh, look, it, it, you know, it, it's spewing out to this S3 bucket somewhere, right? And it's like, uh, you know, not our S3 bucket, right? Like, Something yeah, like oops. this. <laughs> um, so that would be the, kind of the post analysis. And then I'll show in a second, we have um, some of the dashboards that the customers use, or, or one of our customers uses. And they, what they sh can do on top of this is then hook up something like Splunk or Grafana these kind of runtime systems that have alerting, right? So you can okay. alert on top of that. Um, okay. And then when I get into the actual events, we can also do enforcement in the kernel too. Those are awesome. Does that help? Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's do it now. <laughs> Let's see. So for execution tracing, oh, I got to jump. This is going to be a little bit awkward, but 
Um, can you see that? Oh, it's, it's huge. Um, so if you, if you look at this, is a, a Splunk dashboard that mimics, it's not actual customer data, it's our data, but um, we have a few folks doing this, and, and when you're asking, like, what do you do with this data, right, this plugs into to a Splunk database, and then you can do things like, show me all the pods with access to the host network namespace in the entire cluster, right? So like with five nodes, this doesn't really matter, but if you have 10,000 or 20,000 nodes, you can see how, or even 100 nodes, right, and you wanna know um, what's running here with, uh, with host access. Um, you can see Cube Proxy, Hubble Enterprise, which is some of our stuff. Um, I don't know what PDSI node is. Maybe somebody else knows. Nobody. <laughs> Merlin, whatever that is. So you can kind of, they break these down. Um, what else do we have in here? You want to know everything in your cluster that runs with Capsys admin. So we can see there's some privileged pod. I think that's probably some privileged the pod. Must be some test thing that we're running. Um, CapNet raw, cluster wide. Um, so here you get a breakdown, and I think the, the slice of the pie is how many times that it was found in the database over some time time frame. Uh, if you go farther down, then you want to maybe you want to more, know more details about this data. You can see here we have start time, the namespace. These are all in the default, the source pod source image, where it came from, um, the caps that it actually had, um, the count. So this is just an example of, of basically taking all that data that, that's coming out of the system, putting it in Splunk, and then building these dashboards, right? And then if you're, if you're really interested in like, how you tie this back into alerting, is there's ways in these tools to say, like, alert if I see a new, a new thing start with CapNet admin or something, right? Um, the gist of that, I, and I better get moving so that I can um, do a demo. Um, so the, I've, if the exec is kind of the core piece that tells you the exec tracing, the next thing is we have this kprobe YAML file. Um, what this does is lets you put kprobes or trace points or trampolines um, basically on any function that you know, we can attach to in the kernel dynamically without recompiling um, or restarting the pod um, through just pushing CRDs around. And CRDs are YAML file configurations inside um, Kubernetes. And so if you look over here, it's just a spec. You have the call, which is the function that you want to hook. You can tell if it's a syscall or not. We can discover that too, but it, it's there if you want to be explicit. And then you give it the args. Um, the args are interesting. You, we could auto-discover the args, of course. but Usually, um, we don't want to spend the time to copy all the args, right? Like if it's a if it's a, like a write function, maybe you don't want the 4K buffer included in your message, right? So this lets you tell you what to do, and then um, the selectors are the filters, and so you can say match PIDs will let you match certain PIDs. Um, this is perhaps could be better, but basically what that's trying to do is say I don't care about things in the host. I'm just trying to match PIDs in the pod space. Um, which is a pretty common thing to be doing. Forks basically just means we're going to follow the, the tree of, of, uh, of uh, processes until we find one of these. Um, then we have a bunch of operators on the args, um, and then an action, what to do. So basically what this is saying, um, if we just summarize it, it's basically saying if I see anything open Etsy password, I want to follow it, which, which will be a trigger to start doing more actions on it. So like start watching more events. Um, people, you then use this. Um, these are just some tools people have written on top of a top of Tetragon. There's um, this, which is just a CLI. It's fun. You can connect to it. I'll show it in a second. This is just a, a GUI that somebody wrote that shows like the execution trace and then pretty prints some things about what you're connecting to. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way again. Another thing we can do is file integrity monitoring. Um, I'll just be quick. Here's just another thing. If we hook FD install. Almost all kernel um, file descriptors go through there, so you can start to build a, a, a tree or um, a bunch of events on what files are being opened and closed. Um, there's a dashboard for that. I'll show it in a second here. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, very similar to the last one we looked at. It's just like I want to see every file that everything that opened Etsy password in my cluster or something like this. Um, here's another example of doing enforcement. 
If you look at the actions down there at the bottom, we have a couple different actions. We have a SIG kill and an override. Um, there's a few more. Uh, we can also send alerts over DNS or alerts over HTTP. Um, what they do, the SIG kill will send a signal to the process to kill it. It does this in the kernel, um, directly from the kernel. The advantage of doing that is it's in line with the hook. So you're gonna kill the user space process. It's gonna bring down all the threads. Can't be masked, because it's SIG kill. And um, it's gonna set the signal so that the next time the kernel checks for the signal, it's gonna bring down, stop that execution thread. So if you use these correctly, um, I would say, in, in, in this environment, um, you can ensure things like writes never happen. And I'll, sh I'll show a demo here in a second. Oh, and this is a picture showing the same thing. Why do you need override if you do sick kill? Um, so there are two models, right? Like one model is you want to kill the application. You want it to just be gone. The other model would be like a little bit friendlier just to return an error. But in this example, you enabled both. Okay, um, good catch. <laughs> so there are some things that do not, some paths in the kernel that do not check for signals. So like if you want to stop a syscall and you want to kill the process and you don't want to worry about if the path in the kernel has a signal check before it does the operation and you don't want the operation to complete, if all that makes sense, then you can kill the process, override the thing, which will stop the kernel from running that flow as well. So it's more to like prevent kernel side changes. Yes, not exactly, like yeah. Getting back to user space yeah, and yeah. like returning error, okay. And if, but it, you know, I should say, a lot of times we hook just sig kills in, inside the kernel, like deep, deep in the stack. Like you don't need to be at the syscall level, you can be down wherever, in a, like a socket create or a socket close or something. And um, in that case, the kernel is actually pretty good about checking signals before it does operations, which makes sense, right? Like if, if somebody's killed the process, you probably don't want to open a file descriptor for it, right? So you check. So as long as you put those hooks in the right spot, um, you can kill the process and the operation won't happen in the kernel, which is both a win from, from that side. Arguably, if it depends on the operation, it doesn't really matter if the process is gone. Does it matter if it has a file descriptor? Not really. It's coming. It's well, if it managed down. to mount something, probably it matters. Mount. There are things that have effects, like writes, like you know, system, like uh, file writes, mounts, things like this. Send packet. Send packet. Yeah. Um, this is just a benchmark. Um, so you can see, uh, basically, what I'm what we're trying to show here is like the base overhead. And when you're kind of watching execs and library loads, um, it's quite small on a, on a kernel test. So this is running perf doing uh, J16 on a kernel. Um, if we're monitoring all the syscalls, it's a little higher, but not terrible, um, with a filter. Basically, that's a filter to not monitor everything in the system, but just monitor very specific things. So you're filtering out tons of data. Um, and then this shows basically what happens when you don't do any filtering and you run um, you just run that command and try to monitor every system call in the system, right? I think I got that right. Um, so basically what we're, what we're illustrating here is you really need to start filtering in the kernel or you're gonna start hitting that buffer ring over and over again and it's gonna be expensive. All right, let's do, how much time do I got? I got five minutes, let's do a, let's do a demo. <laughs> I, can, I can do it, I think. <laughs> um, how big is it over there? The biggest problem is the resolution on my screen is small. Okay, good. So let me pull this up just a slightly bit here. So this is our, um, our that CLI tool. It's just a, if you don't give it any filters, it will attach, but without any filters. And you can see, uh, there's my system is doing stuff but it's not terribly interesting. I mean, like, it's hard to see exactly what's going on, so let's, let's kill that. And then um, let's do, let's monitor a specific process so we can monitor curl. Um, the top here is, uh, is, the, is the policy that I loaded for this guy. Um, it's kind of hard to see there, let's do this. There we go. Um, so I have a policy to do in monitor install, what it's doing is, is see, checking to see if anybody opens this temp, my secret file I created. It'll then monitor for close events. If anyone writes to it, it's gonna 
I think kill them. Yep, sig kill. Um, and then I've added some TCP connect stuff just for, for fun. So that's the policy. Let's see if I can swap this back out. The top bar is just the, the, the tool, uh, Tetracon running. Uh, I'm just curious, like your customers write those configs themselves or like they no. give you re <laughs> requirements and you actually translate that into yeah, like yeah. function and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so it's internal thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like this, I mean, any, Tetragon exposes, this is the interface to tell you what to hook, right? And so you can hook any function in the kernel with this, right? Like I, by just putting it in that call, I mean, anything that can be hooked, right? Like you get an error if it's, you know, inlined or whatever. Um, and then you give it the args. Um, and you give it the actions, right? So you can imagine you, it's up to the user to build those policies, right? The user of Tetragon. It's unlikely that a Kubernetes dev operator is gonna know like, I need to hook TCP send message and oh, I know it's safe to do a sig kill here because there's a signal check in the kernel, right? You can imagine that that's probably not on the top list of their concerns. And so they're probably, not, not all of them, some of them actually do write these, um, but you can imagine that they would want somebody else to build them prepackaged things to build the, that they can then use to build those Splunk da dashboards. So like the Splunk dashboard was like something we created, gave it to them, they created this dashboard, and you know, now they have all the data. Um, all right, so this thing is doing running. You can see I was playing with it before here. So if we like do a curl, we should get something down there hopefully. Yeah, there we go. So basically because of the pro whatever I have set up in the file there, you can see the process starts. It does a curl out to these IP addresses on these ports, does a send message, does an exit. And that's just a basic flow. If you, if you really wanted to get more carried away, you would be tracing UDP, you'd catch the DNS and all, the, all that good stuff. Um, next thing, because, because you saw we had that, uh, we had um, this my secret thing here. Let's open that. Oh, uh, let's hold on one second. Let's monitor Vim. Why not? There we go. So you see Vim opens up my secret, closes it, opens it again, closes it, opens it, closes it. I'm not sure what, oh, I think those, those closes are for different things, but Anyways, when Vim comes up, it, it opens and closes a bunch of stuff um, it, because of how it does its buffering. Anyways, let's try to do it right. That's, that was what I wanted to show. Um, let's do hello, BPF. Let's save it. Um, and you can see it was killed because we saw the right. We did a sig kill to the process. There is a signal check in that path. So if you... Can you now cat the file? You can, we can cat the file. We have permissions to read it. We just don't have permissions to write to it. Um, I'm just curious if it made it to the... Uh, I know. There you go. <laughs> no, no tricks. Works. It works. Um, so that's the demo. And then, um, as promised, you can see we have some other dashboards here that I just populated up. Um, so you imagine you can take that data that we just saw, right, and then you export it out, and you can do bytes by pod aggregation. You can do egress traffic by pod, um, you know, and you can see these are the things connecting to various things. You can see the sidecar. Just different discussion, right? Um, and then here you have, like, more of the data, just kind of in, in chart format, not graphed. Um, if you want to look at sensitive files, here's another one. You can say, here are all the files that were opened um, by counts. You can see these are the top whatever five things that, that happens. Um, or actually, it's for a binary. It's for the core API. I guess you want to see what core API is doing. Here's the file names of things that core API opens. Etsy password a lot. You can see Etsy shadow. I don't know what it's doing with the shadow, but something. Um, and again, then you have all the raw data down there, or just a chart of it. So, my time is up. So, just a quick thing. Um, 
we maybe did this backwards, but you, you'll notice like that's why we care about these things like T digest and Q digest. We're looking for ways to build summaries inside BPF on these things. Why we use multi-attach? Because you, I did a demo with two or three things there, but you can imagine we have hundreds of things that we're actually attaching to. SROV is interesting because it escapes the, some of our, our low-level metrics on interfaces. Um, application signatures are, um, I didn't talk about it, I only mentioned it briefly there, but there's a SHA, right? So we care about the signing of applications. BPF signatures are interesting. Um, we have, haven't had a, anyone really asking for them yet, so, but I put it up there anyways. I know it's a topic. Uh, stack traces we haven't done yet, but are, we have some code that does it, but we haven't really deployed it. That's an interesting one. What about frame pointers? What's that? What Same. about frame pointers in frame user space? Oh. Do your applications generally compile with frame pointers or without? How much do you care about this frame and stuff like this? I don't know. I don't have a good, I don't have any data point to say yes or no, like what they do. I've not gone around and sampled them, right? We could figure it out probably. Um, well, because if they don't build with frame pointers, like user stack traces are meaningless. Yeah, we could figure it out though because they're um, mostly they're public, like a lot of the major things are published um, like images for Kubernetes. So we could go and look and see if things like Nginx and all these things have, have the frame pointers or not, I'm not sure. And then we're, we have a lot of networking stuff. I, I put that there because you know I'm working on it, so it's, it was top of mind. Um, uh, contribution slide, it's on GitHub, if you care. Cilium, Tetragon, there's all these, all the examples I had today are in the CRD's examples um, directory, so you can load them if you want to try it. And uh, thank you, this is our nice slide. Any questions? No, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.